Hi guys, welcome to this, the final video in my series of videos on the sign of four. And today we're going to look at the final section from chapter 12 in which we get a full resolution of Jonathan Small's confession, find out details around his revenge that kind of match up with details from earlier on in the novel, and we're going to get a nice summing up from Sherlock Holmes and what I think is one of the most important factors when approaching writing essays for this whole novel. There's a really, really great thing right at the end. So please do stick with this video and make sure you get there. Uh, but before we do start looking at it, let's just recap what's happened in chapter 12 so far. So we're looking at Jonathan Small's confession and we see that Jonathan Small has been arrested. He was originally uh, sentenced to death, but he had that commuted to life in a colonial prison. On the Andaman Islands. Um, and that is where we kind of find Jonathan Small here. Uh, this reading is going to continue exploring themes around colonialism, uh, the British Empire, um, attitude towards uh, indigenous people, all of which links in with Victorian fear, remember. We're going to get more on the hollowness of wealth and this section resolves the things we've been talking about so far around the duality of people. And we get Sherlock Holmes kind of explaining what he feels regarding the duality of people. But but let's let's just begin. So I'm starting from here. At last it seemed to me to have come. I was changed I was changed from Agra to Madras and from there to Blair Island in the Andamans. There are very few white convicts at this settlement, and as I had behaved well from the first, I soon found myself a sort of privileged person. I was given a hut in Hopetown, which is a small place on the slopes of Mount Harriet, and I was left pretty much to myself. It is a dreary, fever-stricken place, and all beyond our little clearings was infested with wild cannibal natives, who were ready enough to blow a poison dart at us if they saw a chance. There was digging, and ditching, and yam planting and a dozen other things to be done, so we were busy enough all day, though in the evening we had a little time to ourselves. Among other things, I learned to dispense drugs for the surgeon and picked up a smattering of his knowledge. All the time I was on the lookout for a chance of escape, but it is hundreds of miles from any other land, and there is little or no wind in those seas, so it's a terribly difficult job to get away. All right. So... Let's start by thinking about how does this passage relate to colonialism and empire. Well, we do have references to race in a couple of places. You know, he talks about there being white convicts, uh, but uh, there being no white convicts, sorry. And at the same time, he talks about how that he himself was a privileged person there. Now, this talks about racial preference. And if you remember back to when Jonathan Small was describing living with Mr. Abel White on the Indigo Plantation... He talked about in the colonies, white people were drawn together, you know, because they were in the minority. And that is being seen here. You know, the, the guards of the barracks, uh, sorry, the guards of the base, they prefer Jonathan Small. And then think a little bit about how does that relate to justice? You know, racial justice, is that fair? Um, the justice system itself, the court that tried Jonathan Small, is it fair the the courts and the guards and the people who represent justice treat Jonathan Small better than the other convicts. We then have some references to Victorian fear, developing this idea that that um, Victorian people were scared of indigenous people within the colonies. We have Jonathan Small describing it as dreary and fever stricken, so it is dangerous to the health. But at the same time, using this, the wild cannibal natives. So this would have been a big thing the Victorians were worried about. <clears throat> Cannibalism is something really scary. It's something really unnatural. And a Victorian audience reading this novel would understand that Jonathan Small was in a really, really dangerous situation, being surrounded by these indigenous cannibal people. I also foreshadows Tonga, you know, the reference to the poison dart. And it kind of gives us a little bit of a show-don't-tell backstory to Tonga. We then have a subversion of the typical Victorian racial power dynamic. 
Jonathan Small is kind of living the life of a slave. The things that he's doing, digging, ditching, yam planting. <clears throat> so here we have a white European uh, having to do the work of somebody of colour at the time. Right. Let's progress. Oh, so, the surgeon, Dr. Summerton, was a fast, sporting young chap and the other young officers would meet in his rooms of an evening and play cards. The surgery, where I used to make up my drugs, was next to his sitting room with a small window between us. Often, if I felt lonesome, I used to turn out the lamp in the surgery and then, standing there, I could hear their talk and watch their play. I am fond of a hand at cards myself, and it was almost as good as having one to watch the others. There was Major Sholto, Captain Morstan, and Lieutenant Bromley Brown, who were in command of the native troops, and there was the surgeon himself, and two or three prison officials, crafty old hands, who played a nice, sly, safe game. A very snug little party they used to make. Well, there was one thing which very soon struck me, and that was that the soldiers used always to lose and the civilians to win. Mind, I don't say that there was anything unfair, but so it was. These prison chaps had done little else than play cards ever since they had been at the Andamans, and they knew each other's game to a point, while the others just played to pass the time and threw their cards down anyhow. Night after night the soldiers got up poorer men, and the poorer they got, the more keen they were to play. Major Sholto was the hardest hit. He used to pay in notes and gold at first, but soon it came to notes of hand, and for big sums. He sometimes would win for a few deals, just to give him heart, and then the luck would set in against him worse than ever. All day he would wander about as black as thunder, and he took to drinking a deal more than was good for him. One night he lost even more heavily than usual. OK, we'll stop there a second. So so then we see more of that, you know, that racial connection, the the idea that white people were drawn to each other. Uh, and we see that Jonathan Small wants to be with white British people. You know, he he desires their company. He likes to listen to them playing, just playing cards. He describes them as a very snug little party. Now, all of this, despite the fact that he is a social outsider, he exists outside of Victorian society now by the virtue that he is a prisoner. He committed a murder. Um, so, yeah, he's kind of on the outside of Victorian society, looking in, wanting to be part of that again. Uh, and that links with a lot of the things that we see regarding Jonathan Small, you know, his remorse at the death of Bartholomew Sholto, um, his desire to have the money and go back to his home and kind of flaunt it and, and appear to be now socially superior. He, he wants to be part of Victorian society, but he can't because, like I say, he's a social outsider. Uh, so then we get the reveal that Major Sholto, Captain Morstan were his guards. So that's kind of tying up loose ends. We then get some descriptions of Major Sholto from the past. Bear in mind, and please remember, this is maybe, uh, is it 28, 30 years before the events of the novel, this flashback. So this is Major Sholto when he was very young. Um, and we see that he's losing money. He's not a very good gambler. And, and think about how that might impact on him, knowing that we know he's a very greedy character. Uh, and we see Major Sholto's greed makes him want to win more. But... He's losing. So the more he plays, the more he wants to win. But the more he plays, the more he loses. So Major Sholto, also actually an unlucky character in this instance, similarly to Jonathan Small. We find out that Major Sholto had a bad temper. You know, he was black as thunder. He was drinking more than he should do. And all, all this leads to paint an image of Major Sholto as a man who has vices. He's a man that gambles and drinks and is mean. So that all kind of fits in with the image that we have of Major Sholto from later on. So I was sitting in my hut when he and Captain Morstan came stumbling along on the way to their quarters. They were bosom friends, those two, and never far apart. The Major was raving about his losses. It's all up, Morstan, he was saying as they passed my hut. I shall have to send in my papers. I am, ru I am a ruined man. Nonsense, old chap, said the other, slapping him upon the shoulder. I've had a nasty face of myself, but that was all I could hear. 
but it was enough to set me thinking. A couple of days later, Major Sholto was strolling on the beach, so I took the chance of speaking to him. I wish to have your advice, Major, said I. Well, Small, what is it? he asked, taking his cheroot from his lips. I wanted to ask you, sir, said I, who is the proper person to whom hidden treasure should be handed over? I know where half a million worth lies, and as I cannot use it myself, I thought perhaps the best thing that I could do would be to hand it over to the proper authorities, and then perhaps they would get my sentence shortened for me. Half a million small, he gasped, looking hard at me to see if I was in earnest. Quite that, sir, in jewels and pearls. It lies there ready for anyone, and the queer thing about it is that the real owner is outlawed and cannot hold property, so that it belongs to the first comer. To government, small, he stammered. To government. But he said it in a halting fashion, and I knew in my heart that I had got him. OK, so we see more about Major Sholto and his greed leading to kind of madness and anger. The, the Major was raving about his losses. If anything comes up about Major Sholto, it's a, a good counterpoint to the things that he says at the beginning of the novel. Um, and Major Sholto here says to Captain Morstan, I am a ruined man. This is that he's got no money left. And he may be ruined in terms of financially, but at the same time, I think he's talking about social status here. You know, if, if he doesn't have any money, then he is outside of the patriarchy. Uh, and, and just to remind you that that patriarchy, we're dealing with men of power controlling women. But at the same time, men that had no power are still victims of the patriarchy. You know, they are still controlled. Um, so, so don't just think that patriarchy is just about gender. It's also about class and power. So then we see Jonathan Small's cunning. You know, he knows that Major Sholto needs money, so he talks about money, uh, saying that he would hand it over to the, the proper authorities. And then we see Major Sholto's shock linking with greed. Uh, he gasped at the, at the amount of money Jonathan Small was talking about. And he stammers when trying to say, you know, give it to the government, showing that Major Sholto finds it difficult to say that you should be giving it to the government. You know, he, his greed is kicking in and Major Sholto is, is finding it difficult to do the right thing. Um, and then Jonathan Small knows fully that he's got him, that, that, that he's manipulated him to do his work. But the problem is, and this is when kind of first person narration and this idea of not, so, not necessarily unreliable narrators, but flawed narrators kick in. Because, John, because Jonathan Small has only just met Major Sholto, he doesn't know about his greed. So there, there is a, a, a quality about Major Sholto that if Jonathan Small knew, he wouldn't trust him to go and pick up the treasure. But he doesn't know it. And so he is in some way flawed, you know. The, the, the lack of information for a first-person narrator results in the plot of the story. So, you think then, sir, that I should give the information to the Governor General? said I quietly. Well, well, you must not do anything rash, or that you might repent. Let me hear about it, Small. Give me the facts. I told him the whole story, with small changes so that he could not identify the places. When I had finished, he stood stock still and full of thought. I could see by the twitch of his lip that there was a struggle going on within him. This is a very important matter, Small, he said at last. You must not say a word to anyone about it, and I shall see you again soon. Two nights later, he and his friend Captain Morstan came to my hut in the dead of the night with a lantern. I want you just to let Captain Morstan hear that story from your own lips, Small, said he. I repeated it as I had told it before. It rings true, eh? said he. It's good enough to act upon. Captain Morstan nodded. Look here, Small, said the Major. We have been talking it over, my, fr my friend here and I, and we have come to the conclusion that this secret of yours is hardly a government matter. After all, but it is a private concern of your own, which, of course, you have the power of disposing of as you think best. Now, the question is, what price would you ask for it? We might be inclined to take it up and at least look into it if we could agree as to terms. 
He tried to speak in a cool, careless way, but his eyes were shining with excitement and greed. All right, so thinking a little bit about this, how does Jonathan Small potentially misinterpret Major Sholto's reaction? So we see that, you know, Major Sholto is very interested. He says, don't do anything rash or he might repent. Uh, repent having some religious connotations, you know. Uh, but but here is the, the key thing. Jonathan Small sees him and says, there was a struggle going on within him. Now, that struggle can represent two different things. The first is the struggle between duty and greed. Major Sholto's duty is to the crown, is to the British government, the British army. So his duty states that if he finds out where some jewels are being hidden, he should find them, hand them over to the proper authorities. However, his greed says that I'm going to find them and I'm going to keep my share. You know, I'm going to split them and get some money. That is what I think Jonathan Small recognises the struggle going on within Major Shelto. However, it could also be a struggle to steal from Jonathan Small or to not steal from Jonathan Small. Or indeed, in stealing from Jonathan Small, he will be stealing from Major Sholto. And we already found out that they are bosom buddies. You know, they, they are best friends in the world. So I think the struggle that really is going on within him is the struggle whether he's going to steal from Major Sholto or not. Because I don't think he would really care about duty versus greed. His greed is so much that he would just sack off duty and that would be it. Okay. So, um, yeah, dead of the night with a lantern. We've got some foreshadowing there that, you know, things aren't going to work out fine. Um, and then Jonathan Small notes that he sees in Major Shelto's eyes greed. Now, this is a, a big warning, a big, big red flag. But Jonathan Small doesn't really see it, unfortunately. So. Why? As to that gentleman, I answered trying also to be cool, but feeling as excited as he did, there is only one bargain which a man in my position can make. I shall want you to help me to my freedom and to help my three companions to theirs. We shall then take you into partnership and give you a fifth share to divide between you. Hmm, said he, a fifth share? That is not very tempting. It would come to fifty thousand apiece, said I. But how can we gain your freedom? You know very well that you ask an impossibility. Nothing of the sort, I answered. I have thought it all out to the last detail. The only bar to our escape is that we can get no boat fit for the voyage and no provisions to last us for so long a time. There are plenty of little yachts and yawls at Calcutta or Madras which would serve our turn well. Do you bring one over? We shall engage to get her aboard her by night and if you would drop us on any part of the Indian coast you will have done your part of the bargain. If there were only one, he said, none or all. I answered. We have sworn it. The four of us must always act together. You see, Morstan, said he, small is a man of his word. He does not flinch from his friend. I think we may very well trust him. It's a dirty business, the other answered. Yet, as you say, the money would save our commissions handsomely. Well, small, said the major, we must, I suppose, try and meet you. We must first, of course, test the truth of your story. Tell me where the box is hid, and I shall get leave of absence and go back to India in the monthly relief boat to inquire into the affair. OK, um, so so think about here uh, Jonathan Small's duality of character. Um, the idea that he hates native people, he hates indigenous people. He talks about that already, yet he stands by an oath to those native people, to the indigenous people and the befriending of Tonga. That's one of his dualities of his character. Okay? We're going to look at some more as we go on. But, but before we do, we get more from Sholto. He, he's greedy. Uh, and this foreshadows his theft. You know, he says that a fifth of the treasure, that's not very good. It's not very much. Uh, and then in contrast to that, and then in contrast to that, because bear in mind, Jonathan Small could say to Sholto and Morstan, find the treasure, we'll split it 50-50. Forget about those three other guys. Jonathan Small says, none or all. We have sworn it. And... In this, he's being honourable. You know, Jonathan Small definitely being honourable, trying to look after the three other members of the Sign of Four. However, 
this is also possibly his downfall. If he'd have shared the treasure with Morstan and Sholto 50-50, then they may have helped him escape more, and Major Sholto may have not actually stolen the treasure, because, spoiler alert, you know, I've kind of alluded to this all the way through. Oh, no, no, you know. Major Sholto stole the treasure. So, if it had been split with less people, then maybe he would have escaped and just gotten the treasure. Um... However, so Major Shelter says, you see, Morstan, small is a man of his word. He does not flinch from his friend. Now, this is really interesting. There are a couple of things to take from this. First is the irony. You know, Shelter is the, is the exact opposite. He really does turn his back on Captain Morstan when he steals this treasure. But at the same time, we see here Jonathan Small being manipulated by a wealthy man by praising him. By praising him in this way, he's trying to get him on side. He's trying to show him, you know, I recognise that you're a decent bloke. And this is all to do with class struggle. Because Major Shelto ultimately manipulates Jonathan Small so that Jonathan Small will tell him where the treasure is. You know, there's no love lost between those two. Not so fast, said I, growing cold as he got hot. I must have the consent of my three comrades. I tell you that it is four or none with us. Nonsense, he broke in. What have three black fellows to do with our agreement? Black or blue, said I, they are in with me, and we all go together. Well, the matter ended by a second meeting, at which Malmet Singh, Abdullah Khan and Dost Akbar were all present. We talked the matter over again, and at last we came to an arrangement. We were to provide both the officers with charts of the part of the Agra fort and mark the place in the wall where the treasure was hid. Major Sholto was to go to India to test our story. If he found the box, he was to leave it there to send out a small yacht provisioned for a voyage, which was to lie off Rutland Island and to which we were to make our way, and finally to return to his duties. Captain Morstan was then to apply for a leave of absence to meet us at Agra, and there we were to have the final division of the treasure. He, taking the major share as well as his own. <clears throat> All this we sealed by the most solemn oaths that the mind could think or the lips utter. I sat up all night with paper and ink, and by the morning I had the two charts all ready, signed with the sign of four. That is, of Abdullah, Akbar, Maomet, and myself. Well, gentlemen, I weary you with my long story, <clears throat> and I know that my friend, Mr. Jones, is impatient to get me safely stowed in Chokey. <coughs> Sorry. I'll make it as short as I can. The villain Shelter went off to India, but he never came back again. Captain Morstan showed me his name among a list of passengers in one of the mail boats very shortly afterwards. OK, let's just stop there then. So. As we read through this, we need to think about how does Shelter take advantage of Jonathan Small uh, and, and how he does it is symbolic of the upper class treatment of the working class. You know, he, he tricks him. He swears all the oaths under the sun to him, and then he steals from him. And he promises all these things, and it, nothing ever comes of it. Let's think about that as we work through this page. So, we start with Jonathan Small trying to control the situation. You know, he says, uh, said I, growing cold as he got hot. So he's trying to put the brakes on a little bit, and, and exert his honour. You know, he, he's trying, to, trying to, to look after the people that he has stolen this treasure with. Uh, and this completely flummoxes Major Sholto, because what have three black fellows got to do with our agreement? This is a colonialist attitude. For Major Sholto, stealing off of, off of three Indian guys, that is exactly what he's been doing the whole time. That's exactly what the British Empire has been doing the whole time. If you remember back, um, uh, Abdullah Khan even says, you know, uh, I only ask you to do what your fellow countrymen come here to do. Uh, and, and then we, we get a, a, a really good contrast between their two characters. Jonathan Small says, black or blue, they are in with me and we, are, we all go together. Yet Jonathan Small does not care about race. For him, it's a matter of honour uh, and a matter of doing the right thing. And he sees it as an oath is an oath. Um, and, then, and then we see Jonathan Small's downfall, really. So they sealed everything with the most solemn oath the mind could think, 
Uh, Jonathan Small is too trusting of other men's words. Just because to Jonathan Small an oath means something doesn't mean that to the other characters in this novel, oaths matter. Evidently. Major Sholto signs these oaths and seals the oaths and all of that, but he still steals the treasure. And then we get a kind of... We, we return to the present. Well, gentlemen, I weary with my long story. We return back to the present. Uh, Chokey, just to say, is prison. Uh, and then he returns back to the narrative, um, continuing to describe what happened with Jonathan Small after he'd stolen the treasure now. So his uncle had died, leaving him a fortune. And he had left the army, yet he could stoop to treat five men as he treated us. Morstan went over to Agra shortly afterwards and found, as we expected, that the treasure was indeed gone. The scoundrel had stolen it all without carrying out one of the conditions on which we had sold him the secret. From that day, I lived only for vengeance. I thought of it by day and I nursed it by night. It became an overpowering, absorbing passion with me. I cared nothing for the law, nothing for the gallows. To escape, to track down Sholto, to have my hand upon his throat, that was my one thought. Even the Agra treasure had come to me to be a smaller thing in my mind than the slaying of Sholto. Well, I have set my mind on many things in this life, and never one which I did not carry out. But it was weary years before my time came. I have told you that I picked up something of medicine. One day, when Dr. Summerton was down with a fever, a little Andaman Islander was picked up by a convict gang in the woods. He was sick to death, and had gone to a lonely place to die. I took him in hand, though he was as venomous as a young snake, and after a couple of months I got him all right and able to walk. He took a kind of fancy to me then, and would hardly go back to his woods, but was always hanging about my hut. I learned a little from his lingo, sorry, I learned a little of his lingo from him, and this made him all the fonder of me. Tonga, for that was his name, was a fine boatman, and owned a big, roomy canoe of his own. When I found that he was devoted to me, and would do anything to serve me, I saw my chance of escape. I talked it over with him. He was to bring his boat round on a certain night to an old wharf, which was never guarded, and there he was to pick me up. Okay, so let's just think about this. Um, so finally we finish, you know, Jonathan Small's descriptions of Major Sholto. He talks about here, he, he says, um, even though he'd left the army and had all this money that he'd inherited, uh, yet he could stoop to treat five men as he had treated us. So stoop linking with low behaviour, and Jonathan Small sees this as beneath social values. You know, again, linking with this idea that Jonathan Small is still longing to be part of Victorian society. Um, and also, he includes in that Morstan. You know, this shows that Jonathan Small bore no grudge against Morstan. The reference to five men here. Uh, he also calls him a scoundrel. Uh, and just note with this, the sibilant sounds, the scoundrel had stolen it all. Sibilance linking with sneakiness, slyness, all that kind of stuff. Now, this is the turning point for Jonathan Small. From that day, I lived only for vengeance. Uh, this metaphor shows how much vengeance consumed him. Uh, even so much as for him to say that the Agra treasure had come to be a smaller thing in my mind than the slaying of Sholto. That revenge is worth more to Jonathan Small than actually having the money. And this links with the idea of the hollowness of wealth. And I think that this shows that Jonathan Small recognises the hollowness of wealth. In that he's more willing to have a wrong righted than to get the thing that's going to improve his entire life. You know, um, here, even Small would rather protect honour than have wealth. That's really the key thing for Jonathan Small. And I think that is the key difference between Jonathan Small and Major Sholto, because they are contrasting characters. Um, so then we have our introduction of Tonga properly. This, a little Andaman Islander, Tonga. Um, he was sick to death. He had gone to a lonely place to die. He was weak and pathetic, like Jonathan Small. And through this section, let's think about why is Jonathan Small sympathetic to Tonga. He's described the people living around him as cannibals. So why would he be sympathetic to someone that he himself believes to be a cannibal? 
Um, we then see the development of their relationship and some real affection for Tonga. I personally feel that Jonathan Small got on with Tonga really well and that he kind of saw a lot of himself in him, a very unlucky person who needed help. And we see this when he says he was a fine boatman, you know, um, and he was devoted to me and would do anything to serve me. And this is a result of Jonathan Small's kindness. This isn't the same kind of servitude that we're seeing with other Indian people in, uh, in this story. This isn't the kind of enforced slavery-esque situations. Jonathan Small has been kind to Tonga, and so Tonga likes Jonathan Small. I gave him directions to have several gourds of water and a lot of yams, cocoa, coconuts, <laughs> sorry, and sweet potatoes. He was staunch and true, was little Tonga. No man ever had a more faithful mate. At the night named, sorry, at the night named, he had his boat on the wharf. As it chanced, however, there was one of the convict guard down there, a vile pathan who had never missed a chance of insulting and injuring me. I had always vowed vengeance, and now I had my chance. It was as if fate had placed him in my way, that I might pay my debt before I left the island. He stood on the bank with his back to me, and his carbine on his shoulder. I looked about for a stone to beat out his brains with, but none could I see. Then a queer thought came into my head, and showed me where I could lay my hand upon a weapon. I sat down in the darkness, and unstrapped my wooden leg. With three long hops I was on him. He put his carbine to his shoulder, but I struck him full and knocked the whole front of his skull in. You can see the split in the wood now where I hit him. We both went down together, for I could not keep my balance, but when I got up, I found him still lying quiet enough. I made for the boat, and in an hour we were all out to sea. Tonga had brought his, all his earthly possessions with him, his arms and his gods. Among other things, he had a long bamboo spear and some andaman coconut matting, with which I made a sort of sail. For ten days we were beating about, trusting to look, and on the eleventh we were picked up by a trader which was going from Singapore to Jeddah with a cargo of Malay pilgrims. They were a rum crowd, and Tonga and I stood, uh, and Tonga and I soon managed to settle down among them. They had one very good quality: they let you alone and asked no questions. Well, if I were to tell you all the adventures that my little chum and I went through, you would not thank me, for I would have, I would have you here until the sun was shining. Okay, let's start there a second. So, um, Tonga is described as trustworthy. This is a direct contrast to all the descriptions that we've had of indigenous people up to this point. Think of all the animal imagery, think of all the violent imagery, uh, the sepoys at Abel White's plantation, um, the mutinying Indian soldiers, uh, uh, Abdullah Khan, Mahomet Singh, the murder of the merchant Ahmed. You know, so much violence and then we get Jonathan Small no man ever had a more faithful mate and I think that this is symbolic of part of Jonathan Small's issue you know he he wants to be part of Victorian society but a lot of the things that he thinks and does and believes are in direct conflict with Victorian society you know Jonathan Small wants to be socially mobile that doesn't fit with Victorian values. He trusts and befriends an indigenous person who is potentially a cannibal. And again, that doesn't fit with Victorian values. And I think that a Victorian audience would, would pick up on that. And, and all of this would lead to greater distrust in Jonathan Small. Whereas to a modern audience, you know, I'm quite touched by Jonathan Small's friendship with Tonga. I think it's a really nice beautiful thing but that's because modern values are very different to victorian values okay so so we, we then see this soldier who he had always vowed vengeance you know jonathan small wants revenge on a lot of people he, he wants to take revenge he's a passionate guy uh, and then he gets his revenge or, or, or he's talking about getting his revenge there i might pay that i might pay my debt before i left the island which is a metaphor, um, and it's a debt of violence. He's not talking about money now, he's talking about a debt of violence, that this person has been violent towards him. 
Um, and I like this because there is irony in the fact that Jonathan Small kills the guard with his leg. You know, it's, it's his disability and he uses it to his advantage. And possibly it might be even more ironic because possibly the guard mocked Jonathan Small's leg. We don't know, but it's a point to think about. Um, and then this, I, I really like this sentence. So they were a rum crowd and Tonga and I soon managed to settle down among them. So this rum crowd, uh, this is kind of a callback to Watson talking about how he'd been in many rum places in his time in the army. Rum meaning wrong or, or dangerous or bad. And Jonathan Small and Tonga fit right in. That, that's some, some lovely uh, juxtaposition there. Because you would say there were a rum crowd to mean that it was really dangerous. Uh, we then get a little bit of missing part of the narrative. We, d- we don't find out what Jonathan Small and Tonga ended up doing. But, but the fact that they were travelling all over the world together for all of this time, you know, like I say, this was some 30 years before the narrative. So for that whole time, Jonathan Small and Tonga have been going on these adventures. Jonathan Small must have a very sympathetic attitude towards Tonga uh, and, and possibly indigenous people on the whole so here and there we drifted about the world something always turning up to keep us from london all the time however i never lost sight of my purpose i would dream of sholto at night a hundred times i have killed him in my sleep at last however some three or four years ago we found ourselves in england i had no great difficulty in finding where sholto lived and i set to work to discover whether he had realized the treasure or if he still had it I made friends with someone who could help me. I name no names, for I don't want to get anyone else in a hole, and I soon found that he still had the jewels. Then I tried to get at him in many ways, but he was pretty sly, and had always two prize fighters beside him, his so- uh, besides his sons and his kitmagar, on guard over him. One day, however, I got word that he was dying. I hurried at once to the garden, mad that he should slip out of my clutches like that. And, looking through the window, I saw him lying in his bed, with his sons on each side of him. I'd have come through and taken my chance with the three of them, only even as I looked at him, his jaw dropped, and I knew that he was gone. I got into his room that same night, though, and I searched his papers to see if there was any record of where he had hidden our jewels. There was not a line, however, so I came away bitter and savage as a man could be. Before I left, I bethought me that if I ever met my Sikh friends again, it would be a satisfaction to know that I had left some mark of our hatred. So I scrawled down the sign of the four of others as it had been on the chart, and I pinned it on his bosom. It was too much that he should be taken to the grave without some token from the men whom he had robbed and befooled. Okay, let's, let's stop there. So um, now, now we see Jonathan Small... Uh, linking with the idea of justice uh, and Jonathan Small's justice is his vengeance on Major Sholto you know he says I never lost sight of my purpose he believes that by getting revenge on Major Sholto he will have justice at uh, this a hundred times I've killed him in my sleep it's, it's a really nice image of, of just how consumed with justice Jonathan Small is remember those three quotations that's a pretty pretty demonstration that's a pretty business and that's a pretty justice but jonathan small's obsession is with justice uh so then he he manages to get into sholto's house by by uh, getting someone that works for him there uh, and even in this we see honor that he won't give up the name because he doesn't want to get anyone else in a hole or anyone else in trouble we now see the timeline start to match up with with um daddy sholto's story so this is the point where Major Sholto is dying and Jonathan Small is mostly concerned that he won't get any revenge, that Major Sholto will die um, and slip out of my clutches, he says. And he then goes and Major Sholto dies and he comes away bitter and savage. Uh, we then have his final thoughts on Major Sholto, that he had to put some si- some sign that the sign of four had been there uh, because he had robbed and befooled them, Major Shelto had. Now think a little bit about this again. Jonathan Small's honour linking to his downfall. If Jonathan Small hadn't put the sign of four logo on Major Shelto, 
then Sherlock Holmes wouldn't have had the evidence to match the things together. If he hadn't signed the sign of for later, as you will see, if he hadn't left these calling cards as kind of a way of restoring the sign of for's honour, then again, Sherlock Holmes would not have had the evidence to have identified Jonathan Small in the first place. Bearing in mind, Jonathan Small's name was written on, on the document that, that Sherlock Holmes had. So, we earned a living at this time by my exhibiting poor Tonga at fairs and other such places as the Black Cannibal. He would eat raw meat and dance his war dance. So we always had a hat full of pennies after a day's work. I still heard all the news from Pondicherry Lodge, and for some years there was no news to hear, except that they were hunting for the treasure. At last, however, came what we had waited for for so long. The treasure had been found. It was up at the top of the house in Mr Bartholomew Sholto's chemical laboratory. I came at once and had a look at the place, but I could not see how, with my wooden leg, I was to make my way up to it. I learned, however, about a trapdoor in the roof, and also about Mr Sholto's supper hour. It seemed to me that I could manage the thing easily through Tonga. I brought him out with me with a long rope round round his waist. <laughs> he could climb like a cat, and he soon made his way through the roof. But, as ill luck would have it, Bartholomew Sholto was still in the room, to his cost. Tonga thought he had done something very clever in killing him. For when I came up by the rope, I found him strutting about as proud as a peacock. Very much surprised was he when I made at him with the rope's end and cursed him for a little bloodthirsty imp. I took the treasure box and let it down, and then slid down myself, having first left the sign of the four upon the table, to show that the jewels had come back at last to those who had most right to them. Tonga then pulled up the rope, closed the window, and made off the way that he had come. I don't know that I have anything else to tell you. I had heard a waterman speak of the speed of Smith's launch for the Aurora, and I thought she would be a handy craft for our escape. I engaged with old Smith, and was to give him a big sum if he got us safe to our ship. He knew, no doubt, that there was some screw loose, but he was not in our secrets. All this is the truth, and if I tell it to you, gentlemen, it is not to amuse you. Uh, we'll, we'll stop there. So then we see Jonathan Small's situation with Tonga it is a life of poverty. He talks about displaying poor Tonga as the cannibal uh, and making him do his, his war dance and making him eat raw meat and all that kind of stuff, furthering this Victorian fear of indigenous peoples, even though Jonathan Small knows it's a nonsense. Uh, and then we see how all the details match Holmes's prediction. All of the details that Jonathan Small is giving show that Sherlock Holmes was correct and that he solved the case impeccably. However, we see here the violence of the native people. Tonga thought he had done something very clever in killing Bartholomew Sholto, strutting around as proud as a peacock. That, that for Tonga, savagery and violence and death are to be rewarded. You know, the murdering of someone isn't a bad thing. And that kind of establishes this kind of parallel, or, or sorry, this, this juxtaposition between Victorian culture and Tonga's culture on the Andaman Islands. But on the Andamans, it's okay to murder in their society, uh, and in Victorian society, it's not. But at the same time, you know, we have to think about Jonathan Small over in the Agra Fort says that in England, a life is worth something. But over there, life is worth less. Now, might that be the same for Tonga? You know, he's in a foreign country. Maybe Tonga feels that the life of these white people isn't worth the same as the life of somebody on the Andamans. So, so maybe, you know... Tonga could be seen as behaving in exactly the same way the British colonialists were behaving in India. Uh, but, but, but all of that links with Victorian fear. Um, and, then, and then we see that Jonathan Small is, is horrified by, by Tonga's actions. He cursed him for a little bloodthirsty imp, you know. Um, again, backing up the idea that Jonathan Small wants to be part of Victorian society. He likes Victorian values. Uh, and and he's cross. He's cross with Tonga for doing that. 
Uh, finally, he leaves the sign of four upon the table. This is more honour for Jonathan Small. And again, it's more honour that links with his downfall. It's another calling card that's going to enable Sherlock Holmes to connect the dots of the case. Um, yeah, a little reference to the poor not caring about the crime. You know, Mordecai Smith didn't care that he obviously thought something was wrong. He just did it. Just let them use the boat. Um, oh, hang on a sec. So, start from here. All this is the truth. And if I tell it to you, gentlemen, it is not to amuse you. For you have not done me a very good turn. But it is because I believe the best defence I can make is to just hold back nothing. But let all the world know how badly I have myself been served by Major Sholto and how innocent I am of the death of his son. A very remarkable account, said Sherlock Holmes. A fitting wind-up to an extremely interesting case. There is nothing at all new to me in the latter part of your narrative, except that you brought your own rope. That I did not know. By the way, I had hoped that Tonga had lost all his darts, yet he managed to shoot one at us on the boat. He had lost them all, sir, except the one which was in his blowpipe at the time. Ah, of course, said Holmes. I had not thought of that. Is there any other point which you would like to ask about? asked the convict affably. I think not, thank you, my companion answered. Well, Holmes, said Atholdy Jones, you are a man to be humoured, and we all know that you are a connoisseur of crime, but duty is duty and I've gone rather far in doing what you and your friend asked me. I shall feel more at ease when we have our storyteller here safe under lock and key. The cab still waits, and there are two inspectors downstairs. I am much obliged to you both for your assistance. Of course, you will be wanted at the trial. Good night to you. Good night, gentlemen, both, said Jonathan Small. You first, Small, remarked the wary Jones as they left the room. I'll take particular care that you don't club me with your wooden leg. Whatever you may, you may have done to the gentleman at the Andaman Islands. Okay, so so then finally, uh, Jonathan Small, linking with his his um, honour, we see that he believes his best defence is to just be honest. And again, that is a very Victorian value. Just be honest. Just tell it like it is. Don't lie. Don't mess around. Uh, then we we return to Doctor Watson's narrative, really. Dr. Watson's narrative proper. Sherlock Holmes showing his ego off, saying there is nothing at all new to me in the latter part of your narrative except that you brought your own rope. Now that That is very arrogant. This, this shows a massive ego on Sherlock Holmes's part. Uh, we then have Athelny Jones describing Sherlock Holmes as liking exotic and rare crime. He describes him as a connoisseur of crime. You know, someone able to, to appreciate the more complex crimes. Uh, and then Jonathan Small's final words. Good night, gentlemen, both. This is a level of politeness, again, linking with that Victorian value of fair play. You caught me fair. I can't complain. That's it. You know. Uh, and then Athelny Jones, just to finish up, his final words are fairly humorous. I'll take particular care that you don't club him with your wooden leg. Um... Yeah, kind of shows Athelny Jones's attitude uh, through and through. Okay, nearly there now, guys. Well, and there... Oops, sorry. Well, and there is the end of our little drama, I remarked, after we had set some time smoking in silence. I fear that it may be the last investigation in which I shall have the chance of studying your methods. Miss Morstan has done me the honour to accept me as a husband in prospective. He gave a most dismal groan. I feared as much, said he. I really cannot congratulate you. I was a little hurt. Have you any reason to be dissatisfied with my choice? I asked. Not at all. I think she is one of the most charming young ladies I ever met, and might have been most useful in such work as we have been doing. She had a decided genius that way. Witness the way in which she preserved the Agra plan from all the other papers of her father. But love is an emotional thing, and whatever is emotional is opposed to that true cold reason which I place above all things. I should never marry myself, lest I bias my judgment. I trust, said I laughing, that my judgment may survive the ordeal, but you look weary. Yes, the reaction is already upon me. I should be as limp as a rag for a week. Strange, said I, how terms of what in other man... 
I should call laziness, alternate with your fits of splendid energy and vigour. Yes, he said, there are in me the makings of a very fine loafer, and also of a pretty spry sort of fellow. I often think of those lines of old Goethe. I will stop there, because I want to do these lines in detail. Let's just quickly go through this. So, thinking about now, how is the story going full circle? We started off in Sherlock Holmes and Watson's house, and we're ending in Sherlock Holmes and Watson's house. Um, we'll, we'll cover the rest of that in a moment. Uh, so, they, they set smoking in silence, the gentleman. Uh, and then we get the final part of Watson and Mary's relationship. Watson reveals that Mary Morstan is willing to accept him as a husband in prospect. You know, this is marriage, this is patriarchy, this is typical Victorian values for women, you know, get married, settle down, all of that kind of stuff. And then we get the final difference between Holmes and Watson. You know, Holmes has, uh, sorry, Watson has this wonderful news, he's going to get married, and Holmes groans and really cannot congratulate you. You know, this backs up this idea that Holmes has no feelings. Remember when Watson says, you know, you really are an automaton back from chapter one this is another way the story has gone full circle we started off in chapter one looking at the difference between watson as a romantic and holmes as a pragmatist and that is what is coming out again they're, they're having the same conversation um holmes here then i should never marry myself uh, and this these are all parts about mary morstan and things but i should never marry myself lest i bias my judgment so that's the, if the woman that he married were to commit a crime, it might bias his judgment when investigating her. This is love versus reason. And Watson is love and Holmes is reason. That's their duality. That's their juxtaposing um, attitudes towards life. And then Holmes says the reaction is already upon me. He is weak. Now that the case is over, remembering right back to the beginning of the novel, Holmes is weak because he doesn't have a case. Uh, and then, and then a juxtaposition, the duality within Holmes. He is both a very fine loafer, a lazy person, and a pretty spry sort of fellow, a very active person. And this, this, if you can remember this translation and use it, if you're looking for a band nine answer, if you focus on the character question, and you talk about this translation and explore the duality of the character that the question is asking you about, then I think you're in. So here we go. This translates as, so uh, I'll try my German. Schade, dass die Natur na einen Mensch aus der Schuf den Zum verdigen man war und Zum. This is nature, alas, made only one being out of you. Although there was material for a good man and a rogue. I want to read that again. Nature, alas, made only one being out of you. Although there was material for a good man and a rogue. That is the duality of character that has been alluded to for the whole story. Watson seeing faces flitting in and out of the darkness. People are good and then people are bad. Jonathan Small's character, Athelney Jones, has this duality of he distrusts and dislikes Sherlock Holmes, but then comes round to him and then kind of makes friends and helps Sherlock Holmes. Um, Sherlock Holmes and Watson, they are a duality, the love versus reason. Watson, loving Mary Morstan, but worrying about class. Um, Holmes is a little bit more complicated. But, but um, Thaddeus Sholto's character, the duality within him, he is an ugly man who likes beautiful things. The duality between him and Bartholomew Sholto. Bartholomew Sholto is greedy like his dad, Thaddeus is not. There are so many dualities in character that you can look at in this story. Please. And, and with this, if you can just remember, um, material for a good man and a rogue as a quotation for that translation, that should give you the, the starting point for discussing the duality of characters. And then finally, oh, there's a little bit, Shalman, death off, enough, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, by the way, 
Apropos of this Norwood business, you see that they had, as I surmised, a confederate in the house, who could be none other than Lal Rao, the butler. So Jones actually has the undivided honour of having caught one fish in his great hall. The division seems rather unfair, I remarked. You have done all the work in this business. I get a wife out of it. Jones gets the credit. Pray, what remains for you? For me, said Sherlock Holmes, there still remains the cocaine bottle. And he stretched his long white hand up for it. And that is the cyclical structure that is created by this novel. Holmes starts by taking drugs and it ends with him taking drugs. Right, I, I just before I finish, I really want to hammer home how important this duality reference is and, and how much you can get from it. So I'd just like to take take the time to make some notes on this final page exploring the duality with all the characters in the novel. You know, choose one and just try to identify one way there is a dual nature within their character. Okay. So that is it. That's the sign of four. I'm going to put out similar videos for Macbeth and potentially a similar video for an inspector calls. Uh, but we'll we'll get there when we do. Thank you for sticking with these videos. Thank you for, for listening to me rambling on uh, and hopefully copying down as much of the annotation as you possibly can. Um, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Okay, bye-bye.